Welcome. This is Al Black with Chewing the Gristle, a poetry chat. This is my co-host, Tim Conroy. Welcome, Tim. Hello, my brother, Al. And today we have a wonderful guest. His name is Kazim Ali. Welcome, Kazim. Hello, everybody. How are you? Thank you. It's great to be here. Kazim Ali was born in the United Kingdom and has lived transnationally in the United States, Canada, India, France, and the Middle East. His books encompass multiple genres, including the volumes of poetry, Inquisition, Skyward, winner of the Ohio Anna Book Award in Poetry, The Far Mosque, winner of Alice James Books New England New York Award, The 40th Day, All One's Blue, and the cross genre text, Bright Felon and Wind Instrument. <clears throat> His novels include the recently published The Secret Room, a string quartet, and among his books of essays are the hybrid memoir, Silver Road, essays, maps, and calligraphies, and fasting for Ramadan, notes from a spiritual practice. He is also an accomplished translator of Marguerite Duras, Zorab Zefrini, Ananda Devi, Mohammed Shakrula, he and others, and an editor of several anthologies and books of criticism. After a career in public policy and organizing, Ali taught at various colleges and universities, including Oberlin College, Davis, Davidson College, St. Mary's College of California, Naropa University. He currently he is currently a professor of literature at the University of California, San Diego. His latest books are a volume of three long poems entitled The Voice of Sheila Chandra and a memoir of his Canadian childhood, Northern Lights. Welcome. Could you talk to us a bit about your poetry journey and, and start and where you first heard your first poem and, and where it came from and those influences. Um, I, I think I probably heard my first poem before I even realized what poetry was. Um, and that is because as I was growing up, we always had poetry recited in our house, whether it was um, verses from the Quran or other kinds of religious poetry that were being recited in Arabic or Urdu. Um, I didn't speak those languages, but I heard the music and I heard the rhythms and I heard the rhymes. So I think I understood poetry before I understood the words or understood language. Um, the first poem that I remember reading in school that I really loved was in seventh grade English class, my teacher, had us read a poem called, was it seventh grade English class or was it eighth grade English class? She had us read a poem called The Highwayman. Do you know that poem? <laughs> it, it's a narrative poem, it tells a story, but all I remember were the images in it. I think the beautiful visual images of the moon and the road and the moonlight and the description of the highwayman's clothes. He wore a, a coat of claret velvet with a bunch of lace at his throat. That was the description of his clothes. And I just, I don't know, I just fell in love with it. It wasn't really until several years later when I was in high school that my high school creative writing teacher gave me poems by all different kinds of poets. Stanley Kunitz, Sharon Olds, Srila Ray, um, and Mari Evans, who was one of the Black Arts Movement poets from the 1970s, Nikki Giovanni, um, lots of poets like that. Those are the poets that I read the earliest, I think. 
Yeah, Nikki Giovanni has a book called Cotton Candy on a Rainy Day. Um, that's one of the first books when I was 17 years old, I asked my parents if um, they wanted to know what I wanted for my birthday. And I asked them if I could have $50, which was a lot of money in 1989 <laughs> um, or 1988, I was 17. Um, I asked for $50 so I could buy poetry books and they gave it to me and I bought three books I had leftover money because <laughs> um, I think books at that time were maybe $10 each. You could buy a book of poetry. I bought three books. I bought Cotton Candy on a Rainy Day by Nikki Giovanni. I bought a book called Homecoming by Julia Alvarez, who's a, a poet um, um, who teaches, I think, in Middlebury College. And then I bought a, po a book of translations of haiku by a Japanese um, poet named um, Machi Tawara called the book was called Salad Anniversary um, and it was just a, a book of of her haiku so those three those are the three books that were you know kind of my the first um, books of po oh and I bought a book by Lou Steel Clifton called Qu Quilting so those were the books that were the first like books of poetry that I read fully where I was not just reading a single poem but reading multiple poems by the same poet, which is a totally different way of experiencing poetry, I think. Who encouraged you to become a poet? Oh, gosh, I don't think anybody did. I think it was more like I decided to become a poet in spite of everything. <laughs> I did have a, I did have a, a professor in, in my undergraduate years um, who, was, who was a poet. Her name was Judith Johnson. And she published a bunch of books She's published about, she's probably published, um, I don't know, 10 or so books of poetry, um, but not, not recently. I think her last book came out uh, a, a while back, a very long time ago, maybe, maybe 15 years ago or something like that. But she did publish, she did publish a bunch of books. She, she taught me in my poetry workshops, but she wasn't, I don't think she, ever thought to convince me to become a poet, quote unquote. I think that's just something I chose for myself and kept doing because it's it's the only thing that made sense to me really. You know, it's the only thing I really loved, you know, passionately. Um, so I just I just kept doing it on my own. And I've I feel I've been blessed that, you know, eventually I was able to publish my work and that people, you know, now there is some people who seem to find something valuable in it. Um, but I think I, in, in any case, I'd probably just keep going and keep doing it because there doesn't seem to be any, um, I mean, there are plenty of other important things to do, but this seems to be one of the things that it's important for me to do. I don't really know how else to explain it other than that. Okay, Jam. Uh, how has this moment of time of COVID of political turmoil, chaos, of political horror. How has it impacted your writing, your poetry? Uh, how have you been able to um, sort of prepare your spirit to the writing table in this time? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really important question. For me, it's always been, um, I don't know, I find myself wanting to be creative now, maybe more than ever, simply because I can't go out, I can't do the things that I love to do outside of my house. I've never really been too much of a homebody type of person. I was always out and about and I love being social and being with other people. And even with poetry and, and literary um, activities, I always love to, you know, go to readings and meet other writers and, you know, be a part of that kind of community atmosphere. And I used to love traveling. Um, you know, I used to live in Ohio, so it's like a little easier to get around. If I was going to go to New York, it was an hour long flight. Now I live in California. It's a little, it's a little more um, challenging, but I still used to love doing it. Now, I don't know, I've kept writing in the early part of, of this pandemic. I was um, going to bed really early and then waking up really early, like two or three in the morning, and then just sitting in the dark and in the darkened house and writing and reading and listening to poetry. Um, 
uh, listening to poetry videos, watching lectures and stuff like that on YouTube or what have you, and just trying to stay creative and writing. Um, I took a couple of workshops. I took an online uh, workshop through the Fine Arts Work Center, and I took another one at the Poetry Project. Um, I've, I've run a couple of workshops. So I just finding ways to kind of stay connected to the literary community has been, been really important. And this book that just came out, you know, it came out in October. So I had to keep busy doing readings and, you know, trying to promote the book. All these readings are on Zoom, but it's still been really, really nice. And, and I have another book um, of nonfiction, a memoir um, called Northern Light, which you mentioned earlier in the introduction, that's coming out in March. And so... I have this sort of lull in between period between when I was doing the poetry readings for the poetry book and now getting ready to do all the readings for the, for the nonfiction book, which is actually, it's a memoir. It's about my childhood, but it is also uh, about a hydroelectric dam in the Northern part of Manitoba that was built on indigenous land. Um, and that's where I grew up because um, my father was one of the people who worked on the dam. So we grew up in the North of Manitoba and then this book kind of contends with what the environmental and ecological fallout from that dam was um, and its impact on the local indigenous community. So that is a, feels like a really important book to me too. And for all we know, I don't know, I mean, I know that vaccines are happening, but I think that the events in March will probably still be remote. Um, so I'll be doing them from the same way that I did the other ones, you know, here um, via Zoom or YouTube or what have you. Um, so yeah, I've just been trying to stay creative. I'm also working on, I have a couple of other projects happening. I mentioned the poet Srila Ray to you. She's a um, Western New York Indian American poet. She uh, passed away in 1994. Um, and so her work is not very well known anymore. So I'm actually editing a volume of her, I'm co-editing, I should say, a volume of her selected poems and letters that it's gonna be coming out um, from a series called the Unsung Masters series. Um, it'll be coming out in the new year. And I am also working on a what, young adult novel, um, a fantasy choose your own adventure novel for the, <laughs> that, will be, be, that will be published in the choose your own adventure uh, series in the fall. So there is a lot going on. I haven't really had a lot of time to, um, slack off or not create. I just kind of had to keep working, working. Like if there's, if there's one given day where I'm not working on poetry, I have to work on the choose your own adventure novel. If there's a day off from that, I have to work on editing the, the book, <laughs> you know? So there's just. That's, you're so busy. That's amazing. That you're... It's a lot. It's a lot. I keep very busy. Um, yeah. Yeah. And one of the four, one of the fortunate things about being a university professor, of course, is that you know, all of this work is also part of what I'm meant to do as, you know, for the university too. So it's not fully, um, you know, I have motivation to kind of keep, to keep busy as well as the passion that I have for the work. Because, you know, I end up with these projects only because, first of all, I don't want to turn an opportunity down. So when this Choose Your Own Adventure opportunity came, it kind of came at me sideways in a way but I've read those books since I was a child, since I was a young boy, I used to read those books. So I was so excited. And then the thought that, you know, the published, the editor who I was talking to there, Melissa Bounty um, was, you know, she said, well, what do you think? Would you want to develop something? Do you want to, you know, would that be interesting to you? And I thought, of course that would be interesting to me, you know? So it's, I'm one of those people that has a hard time saying no to things, you see. And then with Sri Ray, I mean, I'd followed her work for so many years and I was invited to give a lecture um, at the Festival for Asian American Literature that's run every other year. It's bi biennial festival that happens in Washington, DC. It's sponsored by the Smithsonian um, program, the Program on Asian Pacific Affairs. And um, so Lawrence, who's the guy who runs, who runs the festival invited me uh, to give a lecture on, it was called something, it was, I forget the name of it. I think it was called Forgotten History. Mm -hmm. And we were meant to give a lecture on a writer who was important to us, but who may not be no, well, well known anymore. And so I chose Srila Ray because my high school creative writing teacher had given me her work, but 
she only had one book that was published in 1977 and then wasn't in print anymore. So I gave this lecture on her work and I have a copy of that book because I bought it at some used bookstore at some point along the road. And I read as part of the lecture, I incorporated five poems into the lecture and read the poems as part of the lecture. And after it was over, you know, we're back at the hotel, like how everybody does at those, at those type of conferences and you're socializing with people and just chatting and just like we're doing now, you know, talking about whatever lectures we'd heard during the day. And so many people kept coming up to me and saying, wow, those poems that you read were amazing. Who is this person? What do you know about them? And so that's when I realized that there was at that moment, especially with a lot of younger Asian American writers and younger Indian American writers wanting to know, because Srila Ray, she was publishing her, she moved she was born in India in 1942, and then she moved to the States in 1960 when she was 18 to go to college. And she really just stayed here after that. So she lived her entire adult life in the United States. She got her MFA from the University of Iowa Writers Workshop. She's publishing in Poetry Magazine and New England Review and all of those places. But after she died, she just sort of faded you know, away. Yeah, people forgot who she was. So I kind of felt like a sense of responsibility to work on that book and bring her poetry back to people. We so. want to bring your poetry, <laughs> your poetry to people. And so how about reading us a couple poems? Uh, for okay. Our I will. I'll do that. I'll read from my new book. This is the book, The Voice of Sheila Chandra. And it is um, the, the title poem is comprised of sonnets, individual sonnets. So I'll just read two of those. Um, okay, so this one is, okay. Calligraphy is a meeting point between abstract and particular by certain combinations of visual marks to make symbols. Sheila Chandra lost her voice around the same time I found mine at midnight. We went to swim in the sea so we could be in the dark and not know the bottom. But the moon lit up the surface so silver, so slammed. And then the boy with the fear of failure, falling, architecture, voice, God, depth, death, he swam. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. And then this second one, it's a couple pages later in the book, but it refers directly to that swimming at moonlight. That night we swam, the full moon civilized us, federated us, gave us our nationality. We who were lost, I have now lost what little heritage I did have, returned to the rude, rough world, long vowels of morning, evening birds scream, no soft blanket falling to cover, but a throttling, a suffocation of dusk, no silence when the self stills, the absence of noise is itself torture. I cannot sleep, tongued, Loose drones move through a riff by a singer without papers. Those are just beautiful. Tell us a little bit about that sonnet form that you're using. Yeah, I mean, I, I fell into that. The earliest version of, the, of these poems that I'm reading to you were actually, they were not poems at all. They were, while I was working on the first poem in the book, which is a very highly, highly structured long poem, I was keeping a little um, every morning while I was working. I'm gonna show it to you right now, actually. Hold on one second, because it's sitting right here. I was, I was in the mornings, I was working on this poem and then I was writing little notes to myself before I started to get myself going. And I'd just been in Toronto at the Royal Ontario Museum and there was an exhibit 
of uh, Dale Chihuly, who's the glass artist, you know, he creates those giant, you know, chandeliers or light fixtures, but like just with, as if, but there's no light inside, it's just the sculpture itself, right? You know what I'm talking about, right? So the exhibit was of his works on paper. And I bought, you know how you buy those little note cards. So I was every morning, I was sit, I was opening up a card that was blank. And then I was just writing, doing like a free write on the card. So you can see it's just long prose, right? Just free written prose. Um, and I would date it. So that one says August 13th and I would put it away. And the rule was I couldn't look back at any of the previous ones. I just had to keep writing, keep writing. And it was just a way of me warming up. Then I would fit, then I put it away and then I would work on the long poem that I was working on. So anyhow, it was probably, um, and this was in August, right? Um, so it was like June, it was July, August time period. And then um, in November of that year, so this was in the south of France. I was at this um, artist colony called the Camargo Foundation. I had a month long residency there. And I this is when I was doing these. And then in November, I was in Chicago. I had a relative who was doing a medical, um, she was doing medical um, treatment at Northwestern University Hospital. And she was doing a treatment that required her to be in isolation for three weeks. And then she had to have a caregiver because she could, she'd be weak from her treatment that she received and then she was immune compromised from that, right? So I moved into this, we both moved into this small apartment um, close to Northwestern University Hospital, like four blocks down or something like that. Cause we had to be close by in case you know, something happened. And so I was living with her for three weeks, taking care of her 24 seven, basically. I, you know, she would go to sleep late, you know, and when she slept late at late, late at night, I would, or if she was taking a nap during the day or something, I would be able to go out. At some point she was taking a nap and I went out to this coffee shop next to the apartment. And I, I decided to work with these letter, these notebooks. And I got, I had a notebook, which is also right over there. I'm gonna show it to you, hold on. <laughs> it's, this is the show and tell portion. Oh, I love this, I love it. Yeah, so I had this notebook and I, oh, and I started to um, transcribe. Look, you can see at the top of that page. Do you see what it says there? The voice of Sheila Chandra. Yeah. So that's the beginning. This is the beginning of the book. And so I started to all these pages. I started to transcribe the cards. There were 20 cards. I ended up transcribing the 20 card, the language of the 20 cards. As I transcribed them, I started to revise and shape them in certain ways. But it was not until later um, that I went back to this material and started to type it up and shape it into poems that I then kind of had the concept of it as a sonnet. That shape emerged as I was working on the poems themselves. And the thing about the sonnet as 14 lines, it's kind of like, it's both long enough to kind of force you to develop a thought and that turn means that it's going to be a complex thought. It's going to have a part one and a part two. And yet it's short enough to be a box that can hold the, can, the, that can contain it. And I also found that because the poems, as you heard, the two that you heard, because they're so wild and because they move so much in language and they have such anarchy inside them, the extreme structure of that form, this is like going to be contained in 14 lines and is going to have a certain rhyme scheme, although it's a non-traditional, though I use it quite non-traditionally, but I do, I do use it. Um, that those formal structures would help me to contain the energy of the poem itself as a poem that veers towards formlessness, if that makes any sense. Those are, they're beautiful. Both those sonnets were beautiful. Can you tell the listeners about the cohesion of that collection? What pulls that collection together? Well, that's the exciting part is that um, I think it, the cohesion comes from a willingness to flirt with a more anar anarchic understanding of form. Um, it, it sprawls in a way. I mean, I have, four, there's 40 sonnets, 40 of them. So it continues to kind of like, 
reach out into unexpected directions. And there, there are themes and ideas from an early sonnet that might resurface, you know, 10 or 15 sonnets later, there's sort of, um, I think it's like a more organic relationship to the question of in music, the notion of the refrain um, that pops up again. And also uh, there, are, there are three poems in the book, of course, as I mentioned, um, the first is highly, highly structured. And the third is very, very unstructured. So they sort of devolve, I guess, throughout the book because this middle poem sort of has both qualities to it. It has the very structured form of the sonnet yet within that form, it's very, very um, like swirling and, and porous and, and boundless. Um, and there are themes and ideas that, that are brought up in the first poem that are raised in the second one and then come back in the third, including, including individual lines that are repeated. So I guess there are ways, there is a symphonic, to me, there's a symphonic feel to the whole book, even though the three poems are very different formally and they look very different on the page. Brother Al. <clears throat> well, you've already answered part of the question I usually ask, which is, how much time do you spend on revision? But I would like to go to the- A lot of time. <laughs> yes. Yeah. When do you know a poem is finished or is it ever finished? Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I'm not sure if a poem is finished or not. I suppose one, it could be. Um, Certainly we finish poems and we publish them and we leave them after a while. We don't mm. keep working on them. Some people do, you know, Walt Whitman famously kept working on his poems. Emily Dickinson too, she often worked on it, had multiple versions of the same poem. And there's some question about whether or not she really had final versions of her poems. And in terms of modern poets, you know, Galway Canal sort of famously continued to revise his poems throughout his life. and his various selected poems have different versions of individual poems in them. Um, so I don't know about that. I'm not really sure. I know for me, I usually move on from a poem and I feel like okay with turning the page and doing something new. I do revise things for a long time, but I also feel like it's nice to know when to do something new, when to keep fresh and stay. You also wanna write about something different and you maybe, for me anyways, I know many people are not like this, but. I, I want to write, I want a new toy every time, you know, like I want to write a new kind of poem. If I've written poems with really long lines then I want to see, can I write a poem with really short lines? Can I write a poem that only has one line in it? Can I write, you know, sonnets? Or um, I wrote in the end of this book, I wrote poems that are just, um, that are actually like the grids of words. Can you see that? Like we can. Yeah. That's so, I mean, I just always want to try a new thing out. You know, I feel like in that sense, I a little bit like a mad scientist. <laughs> um, the experiment, the, the brand new is always, you know, it just gives me pleasure to be like first on the scene, I guess. <laughs> now, those, those grid poems are really interesting. They really do slow the brain down. To you make have to slow down. I don't read from them very much because when I started to read from them a lot, I started to get used to what they said. And then I would just read the line out because I knew what it said. And I liked it better when I didn't re quite remember 100%. And I have to kind of pick the meaning out a little bit, like stumble over it as I was reading it. That seemed more fun to me. Hmm. Could you talk to us about what poets you're reading now and who's fueling your imagination? Yeah, I'm reading, I'm reading, um, I just got a book by uh, Henri Jeffers, who's a poet that I've been following for years. I mean, I've known Henri for about 20 years now. Um, but we, you know, she lives in Oklahoma, she teaches at the University of Oklahoma. So we would always see each other at AWP. Have you been to that conference? No. Okay, that is a conference that no normally happens, it doesn't happen anymore, at least at no not right now. Uh, oh, it's happening remotely actually this year, they're gonna do, do it on Zoom. But um, it, it happens every year, happened every year. And it was for people who, mostly for people who taught creative writing in college and university. And then it started expanding and you know, people who are independent publishers would go and became a really big thing. 
like 10 or 15,000 people would be there or something like that. So I would see Henri every year there. So I've known about, I've known her for years and I followed her work for years. Um, and she's a wonderful poet, but her new book is like completely next level. It's called The Age of Phyllis. And it looks, it is a historical and literary investigation and interrogation of Phyllis Wheatley Peter. Wow. Phyllis Wheatley, of course, she's the, um, you know, you know, you know who she is. Mm -hmm. But um, as Henri Jeffers did her, she did all this archival research. She not only did archival research here in America, but she went to Africa and did archival research on the slave trade. She learned all of this stuff about like, uh, part of it is supposition, part of it is historical fact in terms of like when Phyllis Wheatley came over, what the ship was like, what the conditions were, uh, when she was, you know, indentured and sold basically, you know, she does all of this, Henri does all of this research and she not only does a book that kind of reconstructs Phyllis uh, Wheatley Peters because she had a married name Peters, which she then used for the rest of her life. So one of the points that Henri makes in the book is that we should not be calling this poet Phyllis Wheatley because the Wheatley was the name of the family that owned her. She used that last name Wheatley when she published her book, but when she married John Peters, the name of the husband, she then for the rest of her life used that last name Peters. She called herself Phyllis Wheatley Peters. So one of Henri's points in the book is that we too should be calling Phyllis Wheatley, Phyllis Wheatley Peters. So she recreates her life, she talks about her work, but then she also draws it into the present moment. So she has these poems about Phyllis on the boat, you know, being indentured, and then it's juxtaposed against poems about the children in the, in the, um, in the border cages. Oh, wow. She, wow. Shows, she shows us, Henri shows us that this history is not history, you know? The conditions may be like, not 100% analogous, but they are maybe like 90% analogous, you know? Um, and so she, it's a, it's a wonderful book and it's very accomplished. Um, she worked on it for about 15 years. It's called The Age of Phyllis. Yeah. So could you share a couple more poems with us? For sure I will. How about that? Yeah. All right. Well, I won't, what a, I'm going to read, instead of reading another sonnet, or two, I'm gonna read, um, so as I said to you, these are, there are three long poems in this book, but the, in between each one are these small little fragments. They're kind of like punctuating points. So I'm gonna read you two of those, okay? This is the one that opens the book. It's called Recite. Small animal, recite. You sent nowhere, arriving in the night, all my forgotten prayers. Not prayers really, nothing to ask for. No one would answer. The crassness of calling a body a corpse, lawnmower sound through the window, the housekeeper singing, is this body a house? Is this house a body? Gods like you, a misfit. You don't fit, he don't fit. Wow. And then this is the last little, <laughs> this is like the last little punctuation of the book at the end. And it's called Wrong Star. One of the themes that runs through the book is the morning star and the evening star. The morning star is phosphorus and the evening star is Hesperus. And so they're both invoked throughout the book. And so then this poem is called Wrong Star. Uh, of, I should say, in ancient times, they that the Greeks said, this is the morning star and this is the evening star. Then, of course, as we learned, uh, the Babylonians discovered and then shared with the Greeks eventually that the morning star and the evening star is the same heavenly body. And it's not a star, it's a planet, it's Venus. <laughs> so um, the Greeks didn't have the math to realize that that was the same body in the sky. So here's wrong star. Wrong star I chose to sail under alone. I did not want to be alone, brought or abandoned. Those nights when I did not know, who could know? Am I invited? 
do you remember? Which question needs answer? I'm wonderfully <laughs> done. And Thank you do ask that question. It's important to know. <laughs> there are some questions that need answer and there are other questions that they don't really need answer. I mean, some people ask, what is God? But that's not actually an important question. It does not need answer. I mean, is there a God? <laughs> you, <laughs> you may need to, for your own personal growth, need, that is a question that needs an answer. <laughs> you know, it could be that one would want to know the answer to that question. But what is God? I mean, good luck. <laughs> Have a good time <laughs> trying to figure that out. <laughs> you know, so... <laughs> <laughs> Reflecting back on your poetry career, because I mean you've had this wonderful career already. Um, <laughs> what does your poetry tend to want to convey? Um, um I, I don't know the answer to that. Because you know, I I, yeah. I, I want to say, after a while, you know, you can you you read a poet long enough. Um, and you can see themes emerge from what they, they want to communicate to the reader, whether it's wonder, whether it's empathy, whether it's friggin' bewilderment or dismay. Um, do you have such a theme, you think, looking back on your point? I mean, all of the above of what you just said, I guess. Wonder, empathy, bewilderment, dismay, rapture, you know? I mean, desperately to just be with another person, to love, to be, to be connected, to refuse the separation and greed and anger and entitlement and violence. And I don't know, all of that, I guess. I think our purest relationships are in, you know, when we're in our family, when we're inside our, the body of our mother, when we're, when we're early in, our, in the growth of our family, the notion of the child in the world, the joy that one feels and the connection that one feels, like maybe even at the beginning of one's life, not really realizing that you're a separate being from the people around you, all of that seems really magical. And the, the older we grow, the potentially the farther away we get from that. So maybe poetry can bring us back into those kinds of commonalities, I, one would hope. Amen. Amen. And, and, you know, the, the other sort of question, I, I, I wondered, you know, when I read your poetry, it's so inventive. It's so innovative to me. And it, it's, it's jazz-like sometimes. I mean, it's just... Oh, I love that comparison. Yeah. It's just, it, and it's, your, your diction is lifted. You lift, you lift us up with your diction. And so how would you describe your poetry? What is your I, I mean, thank you so much for saying that. I love the notion of jazz as a musical um, form um, that to me is related to um, some of the structures of Indian classical music as well. And there are musicians that bring that bring those the bridge those gaps. Like Alice Coltrane is a musician that's incredibly important to me. I've been listening to her music for 20 years or more than that maybe. I discovered her late. I mean, <laughs> I never listened to her. And then I think it was uh, 2001, I think it was when I heard Alice Coltrane for the first time. I was 30 years old. Who could believe I made it that long without listening to her? But that, that, experience of listening to her, they kind of reorganized my brain a little bit, I think. Um, but yeah, the, the notion of improvisation in jazz, of creation, um, and something about like sound as possibility, that's part of, that's part of the ancient Vedic philosophies as well as ancient, not ancient, I mean, I don't know how one can use that adjective, but um, of classical Sufi teachings. Um, is sound as an important, um, 
you know, part of the universe's vibrational existence, you know? So music becomes a spiritual practice. So I listen often to, not only do I listen still to Alice Coltrane and Sheila Chandraff about on whose music this book sort of grew from, but also um, my partner is really, really getting into Pakistani Khawali music. So we've been listening to a lot of that as well. Amjad Sabri is, uh, is, 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 he's one of the singers who's actually invoked in the first poem in the book. Um, but there's also a singer named Abida Parveen who um, my partner sort of introduced me to, who's really an incredible um, Khawali singer. Um, you can listen to her music. Um, oh, she's all over YouTube as well, but um, yeah, I mean, and I listen to all of that and it stirs the heart for me in a way that's like, you know, quote unquote, unspeakable. Like I don't really have words to describe. <laughs> yeah, that's that, that, that describes, sometimes there's no words to describe yeah. things that touch you so much. And Yeah, yeah. But in terms of diction, what you brought up, like, I do feel like writing poetry and creating the sounds in poetry. Like I feel part of that process is a compositional process, the way a composer of music might compose. I really do. And a lot of times I'm led by sound more than I don't know what the poem is about. And I will go into it trying to figure it out myself, kind of guided by these sonic associations. If anything, I'm doing more of that now rather than less. This book kind of broke something open in me and I've been um, exploring a lot of different layers of English. So I've been writing these sonnets that um, include Middle English and include Scottish and French and some Norse <laughs> different words um, and some contemporary slang and some invented words. So, um, yeah, it's just really fun. I feel like language is a really, uh, I think um, Susan Howe said language is a forest. And I think about that, like it's a forest you can get lost in. It's a forest that you have to explore. It has undergrowth. It has like, you know, it's, it's an exciting concept to think about. And so every time I enter the page to write a poem, it's always, I don't know what I'm gonna find there. Are there resources that you go to to help you sometimes in writing, you know, that you, you read somebody as a resource to, to help your writing? Yeah, all the time, for sure. Um, not just poets, but I mean, certainly Jean Valentine is a poet that's been very generative for me. And, and also in terms of giving me permission to approach a certain kind of, of poem, a certain kind of writing um, and a devotion to the very, very personal, um, the primacy of personal perception, I think. Um, Donald Ravel is another poetry, another poet who's um, meant a lot to me. Um, Jory Graham, I read her a lot. I don't always understand everything, but I read it <laughs> and I appreciate it. Um, I've been reading her most recent book. And Fanny Howe is somebody who's been a constant in my life for many years as well. Yeah, most of what I read in terms of other than poetry, most of what I read is, um, uh, I read a lot of philosophy and uh, social theory. So um, I'm in reading about public, at the moment I'm reading about public architecture, like uh, playgrounds and uh, public spaces, how cities create public spaces. and. Um, and what the availability of those public spaces, the role that they play in neighborhood revitalization and things like that. Um, so, you know, all of these decisions are made and they seem small, but they, they're policy decisions, you know, like at some point, somebody decided to start putting railings on park benches so that people who didn't have homes couldn't sleep on them anymore. Do you see what I mean? Or they put little ridges in the subway benches in New York City. So those types of decisions that get made are architectural uh, type of decisions, but they have public policy impacts. Um, I went through a phase probably 10 or 15 years ago where I was reading a lot of media theory. I was reading a lot about the internet and I was reading about speed. You know, Paul Virilio, the French theorist, he writes about speed. So I was writing, reading a lot about speed and there was an Italian um, 
there's an Italian theorist named Franco Berardi. He too writes about speed. He writes about other things, but he writes about speed as well. And so I was reading, uh, he was writing a book um, called The Uprising, which is about uh, finance capital. So I was reading that. I mean, I just read all these different things because I want to understand why the world works the way it does and why the decisions that we make are the decisions that we make, and, you know. I want to know about, I mean, I, I have a background in politics. I used to be a, um, an organizer, a political organizer. I did that for four years. Um, that was my first career after I graduated from college. So I have an interest in all of that. How can listeners get hold of your books? Well, um, my website is www.kazimali.com. <laughs> and I'm also uh, on Twitter. Um, my Twitter handle is Kazim Ali Poet. And um, that's where I mostly update things. Um, my books are all linked on my website. And then my, the Twitter is how I communicate with my readings or if something gets published, all of that kind of stuff. Yeah. Your, your website's really robust. Uh, listeners can read a lot of your poems. Uh, there's links to your uh, poems. It's a great website. Thank you. And there's a lot of video and audio on there too. I can take no credit for it. My agent, Vaughn Fielder <laughs> of the field office um, <laughs> created that website and she maintains it too. She's great. She helps me do all of my works in the world. <laughs> How about reading two last poems for us? I will do. In fact, what I'm gonna do is a, maybe a little bit different is I'm going to read two short little excerpts from that last long poem, which is called Phosphorus. So here is the first one, the first little excerpt. The translator of shadows invite the waking world, gray filmed by rain, rain not even present, but suffusing the experience, more unfamiliar in the world. A dream book is one in which you have to record, but I won't. Sound always lets you, but what if, just what if sound was a metaphor for something past it? Your body itself, an echo of unstruck sound, evidence in the waking world of the dream, all of this unreal playing out in ripples, something spoken, unspoken. And then I will close with this short little excerpt, which I think is appropriate. To discern the handwriting of the book I wrote lying face down in the damp earth, I actually have to retrace the scrawled words with my hand. Can't channel that through crystal molt my wings and be born once more. God help me. Phosphorus, the morning star, was the brother of Hesperus, the evening star. It would be a thousand more years or more before they learned the two stars are the same star and not even a star, but a planet. Dusk, you do keep me up all night with your dumb questions and pointless chatter. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is wonderful. And this, you wanna see before we leave, this is the actual um, book that I wrote face down in the ground that I had to read, that I didn't, could not discern. And I had to retrace with like, see, that's what, that, that's the writing. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> We want to thank our poet today, Kazim Ali. This has been a wonderful time. We wish it could go longer, but thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. It was great chatting with you guys.